excited to bring our guest on. So let's welcome Megan tonight. Mm, thank you, Lynn. Thank you. It's just a privilege to be able to come and share with you and be on t Girl Talk. I'm so excited of yeah. what is happening uh, for yeah. you in doing this. And, uh, and thank you. It's an honor for me to be here. Yeah, well, it's great to have you from, it's so awesome that we can just come together, Megan. I mean, it's Austra you're in Perth, Australia, the other side of the world and, Amazing, you know, a different it? time zone and, but yet yeah. we can come together and um, it's so great to see you. It's been a long time since we've been able to catch up and I'm excited yeah, about what God is going to do. And I know that there's those watching who probably known you because I know that some people from Australia there are, are going to be watching and tuning in whether they're watching live uh, or they're going to watch the program after the recording but if, for those of you who are watching tonight if you just let us know where you're watching from we would love to hear from you and and share the pro share the podcast and I'm just so excited you know we're calling it girl talk and we want it to be real talk where we can come together with people like Megan and we can hear real stories that are going to encourage us and strengthen us. And, and, you know, we're going to know we're not alone. I mean, we all have different journeys that we walked on and walked through. And sometimes we feel like we're alone, like we're are the battle so, so big. And so, so in the pit so deep that sometimes we feel we're never going to get out of that pit and that nobody's really understands what we're going through. But mm -hmm. we here at Girl Talk, we want to journey with you as well. And we want to pray with you and encourage you mm -hmm. to just be strengthened in the Lord, that Lord is with you and he will help you. And I I'm just know that Megan's story is going to be uh, really encouraging to you this evening. So let's get started. Megan, okay. why don't you tell us a bit about your childhood? What was it like? Okay. Well, my childhood, it was very safe and secure, and there was a lot of love from my parents. Mm -hmm. uh, I Jeez. grew up in a Christian Methodist uniting mm -hmm. uh religion I suppose uh, my mm -hmm. parents went to church and yeah. I went to Sunday school mm -hmm. uh, so yeah I grew up with good morals and lots of love and safety of that goodness around mm -hmm. me all the time my grandma lived with us as well and okay. she was like my best friend mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and yeah uh, I did find out though when I was a little girl that mm. I was adopted. Okay. And so this actually changed my whole life from that moment onwards. Wow. So how did that make you feel, Megan, when you found out that you were adopted? How old were you as well? When you I found was out? six years I was six years old. That's well, how did you come to the find best, out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's well that's apparently the best time right. that to, to tell a child, so the counsellors say. I'm not okay. really sure if there is a best age to find right. out that mm -hmm. you're, who you've been living for all your life, even up to the age of six, it's not true mm -hmm. and that they're not your real parents. So that really mm -hmm. shocked me. I remember my coming home and my mother sat me on her knee and she said, I have to tell you that that you came from another mummy's tummy and that wow. dad and I are not your real parents and that you had another mummy and daddy and they couldn't look mm -hmm. after you but but we we wanted you and we loved you and and mother tried to again share all that love with me but I mm -hmm. know I still remember it that rejection entered me that day in a big way wow. and I was never the same little girl since that moment even my mother says she noticed it. You were never, broke her heart. Mm. She said you were never the same little girl from that moment that I got off her knee. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it was a real shock, real shock. Yeah. That must have been very hard for your adoptive mother as well to have to very, tell you that. Very, and, very, and very hard. The and then to just, yeah, very hard, very mm. hard. Mm -hmm. So... I, th yeah. I think it, in some ways she tried to overcompensate, but 
and and I had the best of everything. I was given everything, okay. um, um, but nothing nothing can compensate um, what you're feeling when you've got rejection or hurts. Yeah, they need healing. Uh, material things can't heal emotional right. emotional hurts. Right. So how, when you say you felt rejected, in, in which way did you feel rejected? Did you feel rejected from uh, your birth parents or how, how did you feel rejected? I guess I thought as a little child, so going back to a little child's way of thinking in that moment, hmm. I felt that nobody loved me, okay. that nobody really loved me. And that yeah. these people that had taken me in and adopted me, they they were just doing it because they felt sorry for me. That they didn't really love me. Mm. I couldn't I couldn't receive the fact that anybody loved me, and so okay. that that started me on a, on my journey of spiraling down, even at that young age. Wow. So um, how did you feel towards your adoptive parents when you found out? I mean, you said that you grew up in a home that was very loving and, you know, you knew that they loved you. I mean, how, did that did your feelings change? I loved my mother and my dad very much. Mm -hmm. I know now that I had a codependency love for my mother because of that desperation of not being loved, that opened the door for codependency traits to start to develop at that young age. Mm. So I loved her almost too much, the other okay. side of the spectrum, that it was unnatural for me to love mm. her too much because I was so desperate for love. Mm. Um, many times I was angry and had so much self-hate that I would shout to her at times, I hate you, I wish you never adopted me. And she'd turn back and say, well, I love you and I'm glad that we adopted you. And it was just, oh. just an internal, when I felt even worse, but then it yeah. was just an internal war against myself. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing was, the, the whole thing that in me that needed healing was that I felt loved. And okay. I knew I was loved, and that's what I was searching for. So right. you can imagine the choices I made trying to make that happen in my life. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, at least your mother, your adoptive mother, she had the right words. I mean, she did the right thing. She responded, you know, in a way that was helpful to you, even though maybe at that time you weren't fully receiving it or understanding it. I mean, a child of six years old, it's pretty hard to comprehend um what you've just been told you know That's i can right. just imagine yeah mm -hmm. and and i know now as an adult she really did love me she wanted me she prayed yes. to god for years for me so right. she really there is such a strong bond of love right um yeah so we've got this little saying between us um you were born for me and I was born for you. So we know that it was God's plan for me to come yeah. into her life. And, and it was God's plan that I was adopted. Right. Uh, after I found my both my birth parents, it was God's plan. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm grateful for that. But, um, yeah, when you're going through things, you don't, you can't see the whole picture. You don't know where you're going. And right. so it's not until later in hindsight that you can look back and you think, oh, God, that was your plan for me to go through all that. or, And you can mm. see it really clearly and in a funny way, then you're grateful for it because mm -hmm. of who you are coming through those trials yeah. and those things. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, you talk about in your book about going to youth camp and you had an encounter there. I mean, bef with, with Jesus, you know, with Jesus Christ, you had an, a, an official encounter and I'd like you to share about that. But before, before you went to youth camp, um, what led up to you going to youth camp? Like how did you come to go to a Christian camp? I had a friend who was a family friend. Mm -hmm. uh, she was uh, four years older than me. 
Mm -hmm. um, but because our parents were friends, right. we were friends too. Um, and she had friends that were going to the youth camp. And so right. I got invited through her. Mm. Uh, and I was 14 at the time. Actually, I think she was three years older than me, 17, I think she was, something. Okay. Anyway, anyway, um, yeah, I went through invitation with her. And we really only went because boys were going. And at 14 <laughs> and 17. That was a thing, right? We, uh, we group was the boys were there. So that was really I wasn't searching for anything but filling the love mm -hmm. hole. Mm -hmm. um, and it was boys. So I went hoping hoping that I'd find love at camp right and I did but not how I expected okay all right so so what happened um well what was your um, encounter like like I, I know that yeah, you it was, yeah it was just incredible mm -hmm. I had on day two I met another girl and she was telling me about Jesus and how much he loved me mm -hmm. and how that she never feels alone now that she has him in her life and that hit me because as i've just mm. shared right i i wanted that love that she was talking about and mm. i always felt alone and unloved and so mm. i just she said you can invite jesus into your life and and have what i've got and so i did she led me through a prayer that afternoon mm. and then at night time, I got into my camp bed in my sleeping bag, mm -hmm. and I remember. And after I gave my heart to him, I felt this amazing peace come upon my my life, mm -hmm. and it was stayed with me. It was with me, and I remember lying down and and just closing my eyes and saying, "Thank you, Jesus. I really feel your peace, and I I can yeah. feel you." Mm -hmm. And and then I opened my eyes and there was a, a man sitting at the end of my bed wow. and I got a fright. Instantly I got a fright because there I am, a 14-year-old girl at camp, in my dorm, just wow. lying down, wow. said thank you to Jesus, opened up, there's a man sitting there. I went into this instant fright. And the only way I can explain it, it was like spirit to spirit. There were no words. I didn't open my mouth and speak, and nor did he, but... I could hear what he was saying in my spirit, in my heart, mm. and then I spoke to him through my silence from my heart. And when I was afraid, he just said, it's all right, it's me, it's Jesus. And wow. I just knew that it was. I just knew wow. I could feel him spiritually all around him. And I said to him, oh, oh, thank you, Jesus, for, for what happened today. I said, I gave my heart to you today. I said, right. I'm so glad I did. I feel your peace and I feel your love and wow. just thank you. Wow. And then he looked down. He was sitting sideways and he looked down at his feet and he looked like he knew something that I didn't, but he couldn't tell me hmm. and he was a bit worried about it and then he just looked sideways at me and looked up at me and just said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Wow. And I just thought, oh, thank you. Thank you. That's nice. I have your peace. <laughs> now you've said that for me. Thank you. Oh, you, you're you really nice, Jesus. You're just nice. <laughs> and then I just drifted off to sleep. And wow. then the next day I woke up and I thought to myself, gosh, the girl leading me to Jesus, she didn't tell me that he was going to come and say that <laughs> afterwards. I wish she'd given me the heads up and told me because I got so yeah. scared. And I tell anybody I thought that was a normal thing you give your heart to Jesus he sits on your bed and he comes and says he'll never leave you he'll never forsake you I thought that was normal and I wow. never said anything to anybody but hmm. I know now that it was a bit of a setup because at 14 right. still looking for love yeah I had 10 years of making really bad choices okay and yeah it wasn't until 10 years later that Jesus came to me again wow, um, and proved that he would never leave me or never forsake me because then I had another encounter with God then, God Almighty, and that was wow. my turning point. Um, okay. Yeah, in my bathroom, it was 
whole chapter in my book. It takes a whole chapter to explain what happened. But mm. that was my turning point. Okay. And at 26 years old, I'm, yeah. So just, what led up to that um, second encounter? Like what, what where were yeah, you at then when it happened? Yeah, and what was your yeah, journey between age 14 to, to that encounter? Yeah. Um, um, I mean, promiscuity, self-harm. Mm -hmm. Um, wow. Eating disorder, anorexia. Um, mm. I had so much self hate. I hated myself. I was just, you know, drugs, alcohol, the whole lot that really, mm. that only sin offers you to soothe your torment and trauma of what mm. you are looking for yeah. to find that wholeness and healing. Yes. Um, so I did that in such a big way. And Everyone was leaving me in my life um, okay. and my husband at the time had walked out on me oh and my. it just seemed like everyone was leaving me and I'd hit absolute rock bottom oh and I cried out to God and looking in the mirror in my bathroom, cried out to God and my heart cry was, why does everybody leave me? Why does everybody leave me? I, why, you know, my adopted parents didn't want me. Mm -hmm. um, friends at school bullied me. I just had a tumultuous time of just yes. people doing the wrong thing by me always. And all I wanted was to be loved. And wow. I'd let people in in my naivety and vulnerability and then just get hurt again and again and again. And after 26 years of it, I couldn't take it anymore and just cried out to God and said, why does everyone always leave me? And that's when Jesus came again. I didn't see him again as a person, but I could feel his spirit and the same voice said to me, remember at camp what mm. I said to you, I will never leave you. I wow. will never forsake you and here I am again wow. and I'm that's here awesome. for you. Yeah, it was amazing and I just... Yeah, I just this white fire just went through me and and that was it. It was like, yeah, that was yeah. I received God's love and and I was just filled with his spirit and there was there's been no going back. No going well, back. Well, it's really interesting that he said I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I mean, at 14 years old, I'm sure you didn't maybe you didn't even know that was in the word of God. Um, you know, that, no, I didn't know. And so God says that to you, and all you've had is rejection and, like you said, hurt. And and so how that must have been so pivotal for you to really comprehend and understand what that meant when you encountered Jesus again at age 26, you know? Oh, yeah, like, I will never leave you. I mean, you've yeah. been hurt, you've been rejected. And I know many women that are watching today, they probably can, um, you know, relate to you and what they've been through. I can say that myself. I had a lot of rejection growing up and, you know, my parents divorced and my dad left. He wasn't in the picture and you go looking for love in all the wrong places and you try and fill that void. But Jesus, he said to you, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I mean, that's something that can really stick with you. And, and, and I know from reading your book that it helped you through your journey, although it was a long journey. I mean, you had a long journey from where, you know, you started at six years old, actually. And I know you share in your book that you actually got addicted to alcohol at age six. Yeah, that's right. Quite innocently, though, yeah. my grandma, who lived with us, my best friend, we did everything together, and she had toddy time at 4 o'clock. <laughs> McWilliams, Mc, McWilliams Sherry. Wow. Um, cherry, Sherry, or, you know, and it was sweet. It was a bit like cough medicine, but it was warmer. Okay. Than, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and she had toddy time. So we sat down together and had toddy time together in these little sherry glasses that were all butterfly etched and the whole thing. It was just a thing to do with grandma. I looked forward to it every afternoon. Wow. And I didn't realise then, and she didn't either, I suppose, right. that it was giving me a taste for alcohol. And so then when I went through my childhood traumas and things, I thought, oh, well, if I go and have some of the yummy lolly drink, I used to think of it as lolly drink. 
Wow. Because that made me happy. That would not make me happy, but it, it obviously numbed. It right. soothed me. Happy isn't the right word. It soothed me. It soothed mm-hmm. my pain mm-hmm. and and numbed me, I suppose, and I became addicted. So, yeah, right. I pretty much drank my whole life mm-hmm. um, from 6 to 26. Wow. Um, until, yeah, God had that encounter and I just, yeah, God just then started the process of healing me Mm -hmm. um, layer by layer like an onion and it's been a big onion, been a big onion but and God's still healing layer by layer because I don't think we ever stop our healing and refining journey. No, that's true. He's faithful and he... He, what he what he started in us, the good work he started in us, he'll be faithful to mm-hmm. complete it uh, yeah. for his glory. And and mm-hmm. it's wonderful to just be in that process with yeah. him. Absolutely. There's nothing yeah, addiction, better. Addiction can be uh, a terrible thing to walk through. And, you know, what started out to be innocent for you ended up being a, a real addiction and but praise God that you got that addiction broken and God helped you overcome that. And, you know, we, you've learned, obviously, to fill that void with Jesus. I mean, he's the real thing. He's the real peace, you know, um, that that we can have, that, that real fulfilling, the real fulfillment that no man can bring. I mean, no. even a parent, a parent can't give you what Jesus can give you. I mean, no. people will let us down. Even good yeah. people let us down in life. But the fact that, you know, Jesus said to you, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He'll never let us down. You know, he might yeah. not always give us what we think we need or what we want. Um, but Jesus, he, he's He's looking out for the best for us. Amen. That's right. Yes, absolutely. So, Megan, I, I know that you went on a journey to find your birth mother. Um, why don't you tell us a bit, how, you know, when that started, when you started having an interest to find your birth mother, how that happened, and uh, what happened once you did finally find her? Yeah, thank you. Uh, when I had my first child, mm-hmm. I had this insatiable desire to find my birth mother. Mm. So I started looking and all the doors closed. Mm-hmm. And then I let it. I let it go, and I just thought, well, if and when it's ever the right time, God, you you will make it happen. And then one day, out of the blue, I just felt it's time to find her. So the first agency I contacted, I found the connection, and the door opened up straight away. Wow! So yeah, that was amazing. So then I um. I contacted her and we mm-hmm. met mm-hmm. and that was just incredible as well. I yes. was a Christian and okay. when I found her, she mm-hmm. was a Wiccan witch. Ooh. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Wow. So there was black and white together, light and dark. In the mm-hmm. spirit realm, there was such a clash. But the bond and the cord that we had between us of mother and child Hmm. Um, was incredible. When I met her, the day that I met her and she held me, embraced me, It all I could feel was I felt like I was a baby hmm. and my mother was holding me. I just felt mm-hmm. like a baby being held in, my, in her mother's arms. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was incredible. But hmm. what was revealed bit by bit, in finding her that needed to be uncovered in my life to bring more healing and mm-hmm. a lot of generational healing, right. uh, God opened up those doors that day. Mm-hmm. And so that mm-hmm. was process to walk through with her in those things. Right. So um, when you met her and did she explain to you why she gave you up for adoption and you know, did she want to give you up for adoption? And how did that make you feel? She was 18 and okay. in 1962, okay. uh, as you can imagine all those years ago, um, 
a woman could not have a child out of wedlock. Right. Um, when, I, when I found her, she tried me. She told me that she tried to self-abort me, wow. and she also tried to commit suicide while I, she was carrying me to end both our lives because the trauma for her okay. uh, was incredible. Mm. So that was the shock, sitting there listening to her tell me that. It oh, kind goodness. of made sense to the rejection that I had felt even as a little girl because mm -hmm. then it showed me that, yeah, I... I was rejected even from way back then in the womb when she was carrying me. And then mm. she continued to tell me other things that okay. just just floored me to yeah. things that I had encountered in my life concerning, well, you've read my story, so you know about the wardrobe. Yes. But the wardrobe and the whole wardrobe door thing, um, would you like me to share a bit? Sure, about yeah. That? Share about your wardrobe experience. Now, I know in North America we would probably call it a closet. Okay. <laughs> Do you know closet. what I mean? Yeah, closet, yeah. Same yeah. thing. It's a wardrobe. Okay. So just yeah. for those viewing who, okay, so tell us about your closet wardrobe experience, Megan. Yes. Yeah. Well. And, and, and how it related to your birth mother. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. When I was a little girl, and grandma and my mother would come in and tuck me in and say the Lord's Prayer with me every night. Mm. Wow. Uh, that was fine until one day I changed from little girl furniture to big girl furniture and I had a bed and, and, and a wardrobe and chest of drawers. And the first night okay. when they were saying my prayers, I looked at the wardrobe and I started to hyperventilate in a panic okay. mm. that is is the is the door shut is the wardrobe door shut i couldn't for the, i just this this trauma phobia came over me with the wardrobe door hmm. so my grandma would go over and and say no the the wardrobe closet door it it's shut it's it's mm -hmm. fine and knowing it was shut i went off to sleep every night hmm. is the wardrobe closet door shut shut is it shut and no one knew where, why. My mother used to say to me, what happened to you with the wardrobe closet that you are so fearful of? And I'd go, I don't, I don't know, nothing. Okay. Um, and this plagued me every night, mm. all night, for mm -hmm. my whole life, my whole life. Even as a grown adult woman, I had to, before I got into bed, make sure the closet wardrobe door was shut. And then once okay. I knew it was, and I'd hop into bed. And then as I was sitting, and I'm I'm 30 when I found my birth mother. Okay. And as she was unraveling her grief and story of how the, everything affected her, mm -hmm. she said to me that um, I, I needed you needed to be adopted because my father was such a narcissistic alcoholic drunk that if I'd have kept you, he would have destroyed you. Oh. And so um, hmm. she told me that when she was carrying me, she used to go home for a visit okay. and she used to, because he was drunk. And, and so she didn't live at home when she was carrying you, Megan? Pardon? She wasn't, she, she wasn't at, living at home when she was carrying you? She was sent away with auntie. Okay. Oh, yeah, I and see. And would come home for visits. Yeah. Oh, okay. And so... In her visits home, having to escape him, she would mm. hide in an old musty closet wardrobe in the spare room. Okay. I'm in her belly. I'm. She's fearful and anxious and okay. I'm spinning and turning. She's in the wardrobe. It's open a crack for fresh air because it was all musty with old cigarette coats and everything and she was just talking to me, it's okay, my little one, we're safe in here, safe in here, until he got so drunk, passed out, then she'd come out. And that happened wow. every time she went home, that scenario. Wow. So when I met her and she's telling me that from Goodness. her side of the story, this happened to me. Yeah. I had to in a wardrobe. That's how bad it was for me. Mm -hmm. But I'd leave it open just a crack. You can imagine how I am on the receiving end thinking, how is that possible? 
because my whole life I've had a phobia about a wardrobe door being open and mm. I go into this fear, this hyperventilative fear mm -hmm. until it's shut and piecing it all together instantly while she's telling me this, I'm thinking to myself, that happened to me when I was in your womb. I wasn't even born then. Goodness. So uh, the, re the, re the reality of trauma mm -hmm. and mental health issues and phobias and anxieties mm. that can actually be transferred from mother to child or from the, your surroundings right. permeate into the growing baby in the womb. Goodness was phenomenal phenomenal i just thought to myself because uh, i've always been passionate about mental health because it's been my journey but then when that happened to me it's like hmm. mental health starts in the womb god was showing me the actual how far the root i had to go back to break and hmm. to get healing from that root god hmm. will always take you back to the root we right. can put band-aids we can put band-aids on our trauma Mm -hmm. uh, and in any way, we know the world's band-aids, but even even in God, we can put a scripture on or we can never really go deep enough maybe mm -hmm. or, yeah. or we just don't know. But yeah. God will always want to take us to the root of our trauma and go as far back as that root is and pluck that root up so mm -hmm. that when the root's gone, there's no branches to grow. There's no fruit to display. It's it's gone. Once the root is gone, it's gone. And mm -hmm. for God, He took me right back to that place, that root, mm -hmm. and healed me once and for all. Right. Uh, uh, which is another encounter in my book. Yes. Uh, that's a whole other chapter right. um, of how God took me through a journey where I had to, um, even in my fifties. I had to, God said, right, the time now, it's the root. And I mm. had to go to bed and sleep with the wardrobe closet doors wide open. And mm. that was confronting my fear. Okay. And that was confronting uh, me having to be cognitively, emotionally, spiritually, physically healed right. in, that, in that healing episode, which took probably about three hours. But God was healing me again. And mm -hmm. uh, once you're healed, you're healed. And yeah. it's only your choice if you want to go back and open old wounds. Right. But God will, always, God will always be bringing you to that place where he wants to heal you. And the best mm -hmm. thing you can do is surrender and say, yes, Lord, no matter how painful it is, no matter what you have to do, mm -hmm. let's just do this together. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's true. We go through testings in life, and some testings last a long time until we really, like you say, we get to the root of the situation, we deal with the roots, so we can be forgiven, and we can forgive, and we can let go of things and be healed of trauma, of things we've been through. Like, I know in your book you shared um, when your mother um uh, was in the wardrobe and you were pregnant and she was pregnant with you and you would just move around so abruptly in her womb that she would just touch your tum her tummy and just say, it's okay, my dear, it's okay. You know, to tr trying to comfort you. Like she even sensed that uh, you were going through trauma in, in her womb. You yeah, know? no, she she definitely knew. She was picking that up every time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think in my research I have found out now that um, about the last 20, 25 years, um, um, people have been discovering, scientists mm -hmm. and bio biochemists and all different people that that's their mm -hmm. um that's their field they have now been able to prove scientifically how that happens that that mm. cortisol cortisol is that stress hormone mm. and when a mother is stressed that activates that cortisol hormone in her which pulsates right. through the baby yeah. and too much of it will um, destroy the protective protein in the amniotic fluid that surrounds mm. the baby 
yeah. uh, from normal natural stresses of every day. But when it's trauma from the mother, hmm. the cortisol breaks down that pro those pro protective proteins and virtually just um, takes away that shield, if you like, so that hmm. that cortisol eventually permeates through into the child and mm -hmm. anxiety starts to be permeated and flood through that child. Think of a heroin addict, a heroin mother, mm. inject heroin, it permeates yes. through the baby. Yes. Well, cortisol is a substance, it's mm -hmm. a chemical. So okay. when the mother when the mother is stressed and traumatized and it releases that cortisol, mm -hmm. um, that permeates through the baby as well. Yes. So it's not just like, oh, I've thought this is how it happens. Right. Scientifically now it's proven that this mm. is how it happens and it does happen. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so so yeah. really a, a pregnant woman needs to to really guard herself against any trauma. That's uh, true. And if, and if you're in a situation, traumatic situation, mm. you need to get out of it not for the yeah. for your just for your sake for the sake of that baby that's uh, true it's so yeah. important yeah so knowing what you do know megan um what, what you found out about your your birth mother once you found out her story and you know she told you basically it wouldn't have been good if you would have if i would have kept you and you came home to be with with my father because of what you would have went through so when you heard her story, how did you feel afterwards about being adopted? Did you feel relieved, you know, that you were adopted? And do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. It's almost like God gave me a window to look through. Yes. And look through and see that this was my plan and purpose for you to be adopted. There was a greater okay. purpose and reason that I ordained right. for you to adopted um and this was one of them because mm -hmm. if i had have stayed with her my life yes. would have been a lot worse yes and so then i was grateful to god right. for being adopted and i yeah. made peace that was another layer of healing to be able to make peace with That's another cool. layer of healing yeah. uh to to get the revelations and the understandings of what mm -hmm. god is doing when we go through things and it's mm -hmm. we go through our traumatic valley experiences, our dark times, God is doing it for a purpose, but yeah. we can't see it at the time. And often yeah. we go into fear or we struggle or we resist or um, mm -hmm. uh, we, we reject it. We don't want to. We don't want to go down that path. Sometimes we think it's the devil right. doing these things to us, but, but, but when we go through those dark times and our valley experiences, mm -hmm. God is leading us through for a greater purpose than we know at that time. And so just to be able to trust him and walk through it. Right. He's not going to leave us or forsake us. We're always going to have his peace. We can hold his hand. And then when he's brought us through, we look back and he shows us why we went through it and the other thing that i just i love in god which mm -hmm. i've used many many times and quoted this scripture and i'm sure you have too and everybody else has mm. that all things work together for good yes. for those that love god and are called according to his purpose romans eight twenty eight. it's just it's no. it doesn't whenever you're going through anything and it's it's a bad it's bad and it even mm. might be the enemy right but, to just let everything go and go and say, God, right in this moment, I just trust that whatever is happening to me, somehow, someday, some way, you'll yes. turn it all around for good. And I trust mm. you. I don't understand, right. but I trust you. And if we can just have that relationship with God, mm -hmm. he'll bring us through and, yeah, reveal to us that everything that we go through is for a greater purpose, for his glory. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, it was a long journey for you to go on to find out, you know, you were adopted to find your adoptive mother and to walk out that journey and to be healed of so many things, you know, that God is taking you through. And so 
But you do mention in your book that you had a lot of, you know, rejection. You always felt rejection, um, different relationships, different things you you went through. So how did you end up dealing with all the rejection, the, those who hurt you? you? You mentioned different things in your book of uh, different things that happened to you where you were really hurt. So how did you come to the place where you could really just give the rejection to God and and have forgiveness to those who really hurt you. Okay. Well, a quick answer to that, because I had many layers and many, many opportunities for that to happen. But mm. the only way that I could say it in a nutshell answer is that his light and his love mm -hmm. drives away darkness mm -hmm. and hate. Yes. So the only way to let any anger, unforgiveness, mm. anything that you're holding on, mm. the only way to get rid of it is to yes. get the love of Jesus, to get the Holy Spirit's fire, his power, to just let him mm. penetrate into you so much so and give him those areas and then just believe that they will flee. And just to, it's it's a process of receiving the love and light from God and letting the darkness and hate go. It's just layer upon layer. Very good. Uh, time upon yeah. time. There was, there was one, my hardest one, I would say, that I had to forgive. Yes. The hardest man that a man did to me. It was the hardest. And I'm real with God and I just say, God, this is hard and I'm, I'm struggling doing it. I can't do it. It's... It, this, it's either so big or, you know, help me, help me. And mm -hmm. God gave me a picture. This might not be for everybody, but this was mm -hmm. what God gave me. And he showed me how much he loves this other person that abused mm -hmm. me, how much he loves the my abuser, that, right. that he died on the cross for, the, for my abuser. He died for them and he loves them. Just mm -hmm. as much as he loves me, yeah. Just because I'm a I'm a child of God and in light, and this other person's in darkness, it doesn't make God love me any more than it loves him. And so, when I when I sense that equality between God's love for me and this person, and then God showed me that when I am projecting hate and unforgiveness at this person who He loves, mm. that it hurts Him. Right. And then I thought, oh, my gosh, I don't want to hurt you, God. Oh, let it go. Let it go. It's mm. almost like, like a light bulb moment. God. Yeah, and it's like my love for you, God, mm. is stronger than my desire to hate this person. Mm. My love my love to want to, to, to do everything that I can that's pleasing in your word and to, to just do what I need to do as a sacrifice of healing for you, that's stronger mm -hmm. to hold on to hate for this person. And it just mm -hmm. went. It was I was delivered instantly. So wow. that was that was that was one time that was amazing. And you know when you're healed because then you can truly bless them mm -hmm. and pray for them and want good mm -hmm. for them. Actually mm -hmm. the dictionary, the dictionary meaning for forgiveness is to um, to let it go and to bless the other person who's who's offended you and yeah. and wish your offender well wish them well um, wish them and well and like that's the love your enemies and bless those who curse you it's almost like you have to be able to wish them well so mm. to be able to actually really in your heart see this person who's damaged you and hurt you in such a way to be able to sit there and actually pray for their salvation and pray that God will love them and pray that for God's best down upon yeah. them and for God's mm. blessing to rescue them and and to pray those intentions over them, right. then you know that you're healed truly. And, That's awesome. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. To, mm. I think I know, yeah, because for, for a lot of times you – we fake it till we make it. We say the scriptures and we want to and we do it and there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. And I think we right. have to keep sowing seed into the field before it, 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 
it happens and um mm -hmm. you know um but it will happen so just keep keep saying it keep doing it keep pushing in for your healings keep that's good persevering just don't let god go in the fact that i'm not letting you go god until you heal me right exactly. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. and just have that attitude and as much as it doesn't look like it'll ever happen just to never let him go amen and uh, yeah hold god to his promises in his word hold him to it and yes hold him to it and yeah and and almost like demand god that it's your word and you said it and i'm not letting yes. you go until you do it and i have it amen. and that's yeah. the determination and the severity mm -hmm. that you have to go after some of those deep healings in your life right and uh, yeah and work with god whichever is personal and whichever way he takes you because it would be different for each one of us how because we are so different as well but however mm -hmm. he leads you just surrender to the process and trust yeah. him yeah that's really good yeah that's really true i mean forgiveness is a process and like you said fake it till you make it we just you know, if you have bitterness tonight, if you have resentment you're holding towards someone, someone's hurt you badly, you know, you just confess that to the Lord. You just be honest with God and say, God, you need to take this from me. And I want to surrender all to you. And I want to let this go no matter what, who it is. Sometimes we hold bitterness towards individuals and we hang on to it so tightly. And when we, when we can really come to the Lord and, and recognize that he's forgiven us, you know, how, how much more should we forgive others? You know, all the things that we've done, if we can let it go and we can have freedom and deliverance, sometimes that's when our deliverance comes. When we can learn to forgive, we can be delivered of so many things. When we can let it go and recognize, you know, God, it's in your hands. You know, mm -hmm. help me to love these people and help help us to see people through your eyes. And, and we don't know what, why people do the things they do to us. I mean, what's their story? What's their journey? What have they been through? Why do they feel the way they do? Why do they treat people so so uh, abusively? Or, you know, what is the reason that behind it? And if we can look at our life and realize where God has brought us from, how he's reached down and picked us up out of the pit and set us free, and then we can look at other individuals and we can say, well, they need rescued too. And, you know, that's what it's all about. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, right? Like those who are lost, he wants to save people from their pit, from their, from their trauma, from what yeah. they're going through. And tonight, I really hope you ladies that are, or anyone who is listening, that you would be encouraged by this testimony that has been shared. I mean, for Megan, it's been a long journey. It's been a lifelong journey from the beginning until even now and she even says now we're, i'm still you still work through things we still you know uh, are dealing with things that come up but it's how we deal with them day by day and I, yeah. i'm just really excited about what god wants to do in you and through you and and what he's done in our guest megan megan's life i'm just so honored to have her with us tonight now, Megan, in your um, you called your book um, "My Child and the Tapestry of Life." Can you tell us why you chose that title for your book? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, really, I would have to say that that as cliche as it sounds, God gave me the title. But how mm -hmm. He gave me the title was, I used to be a pastor's wife. Right. And there was a very dark time where I lost everything. Mm. So I lost um, husband, ministry, mm. car, yeah. house, furniture, everything. I lost everything except my three children. I had lost mm -hmm. everything. And in that identity, I was known as uh, a pastor's wife. I was his wife. There was, mm. there was him and then there was me, the pastor's wife, and I was always had the handbag, the pastor's wife. And so when I lost everything overnight in an instant and mm. it was a really dark time mm. and I remember saying to God and crying out to God and he gave me a poem of my mm. life and I wrote the poem mm. and 
I, and I just said, well, this, this poem hasn't got a title. And he said, well, and, I, and, and then he said to me, before he gave me the title, he said to me, this poem is going to be a book one day. This is 27 years ago. Wow. And I just, I just thought, no way. I, me write a book? That's ridiculous. Like that is no. And then, and then God said, yes, it's going to be a book one day. And I, it's, I, I couldn't believe God. And so I said, well, okay, well, I'll only believe you if you give me the title of this poem. And then straight away, before I could even say anything, I just heard my child. Mm-hmm. And in that moment of being his child, that was my identity of who I was in him. And it's like it, I got another moment of healing because it's like I'm not a pastor's wife. Okay, I've lost that title. So now who am I? I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody now. Um, and it's like God said, no, you're not a nothing and a nobody. You're my child. Wow. And that that's who you are in me and that's... Yes. All you need to be in me. You don't yeah. need a title. You don't need to be anything but my child. Mm. And 27 years ago, that's when he healed me in that. And then when I started writing the book, he gave me the tapestry analogy because mm-hmm. that's such a beautiful picture of of the back of the tapestry is sometimes all we see with the pulled ends and the frayed ends and the it just looks a mess, a mess. And pretty much my whole life was just a mess. And mm. but God is the master weaver and he is weaving something beautiful on the flip side when he's ready to turn it over and show us what he has designed, what he yeah. can create and make and bring forth from mm. that only that mess that we can see is yeah. the whole purpose for the mess that right. he is bringing this this masterpiece forth, which is you. Mm. Uh, yeah. It's just an incredible thing. Wow. And so that's why my child and the tapestry of life, that's how that that's came beautiful. to be born. And, uh, yeah, yeah, a destiny woven for victory. So God yeah. wants to weave victories into our lives mm. um, from, yeah, for okay. all of us. So. That's beautiful. That's so good. Oh. Yes, our story, you never know until it, it's all completed. You know, you, sometimes we don't understand the journey we're on and, can't figure it out, like you said, just like that tapestry when you see the backside. But but when God turns it over and you can see the full picture, like even for you, finding out, you know, God really had it in his hand for you to be adopted by the parents you were. You didn't realize that when you were young. You didn't know or understand or comprehend that God had a purpose in that for your life. Uh, he handpicked your adoptive parents for you. You know, we don't understand the things we go through in life sometimes. But as our journey unfolds, everything comes together and we can see the full picture. But Megan, I I was going to get you to read the poem that you uh, put in your book called um, The Weaver. But before you do, why don't you tell our, our viewers tonight, what are you doing with your life today? What's God been doing and and tell us a bit about your ministry and where people can um, find your book. Okay. Well, a year ago I published my book Mm -hmm. after 27 years of waiting on God uh, for that. So after it was published, things moved quite quickly then, and I printed two workbooks, PDF workbooks, that are on my website free to download uh, to do with trauma healing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you can find that at meganreader.com, which is my website, Mm -hmm. which also God gave me a jewellery line to to have, which is called Woven, uh, Mm -hmm. individual pieces of jewellery with every piece has hand-stamped woven, but they are as individual as you are. Yes. Because you are individual and created in your mother's womb um, mm-hmm. from the Psalm 139 that comes from. Mm-hmm. And then from that, uh, I God brought a team of women across my path and mm-hmm. now uh, gave me a, a name of the ministry, which is Heart Weaves, Reweaving mm-hmm. Hearts for Victory, mm-hmm. and brought a beautiful team of women I've got a team of eight women wow. that just 
saw and caught what was happening and just said, I want to be part of this. And wow. so That's awesome. then, uh, then I wrote with the help of some of the women a trauma healing workshop. And so as a team now, we had our first trauma healing workshop, which is local and it's not online or it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's hands-on. So it's a community because we do only have an intake of 12 and it's very personal. Um, mm. And we do that, a six-week program, we just had it, which was incredibly successful mm. in the fact that yes. God was just there and mm. so many women, it was, it was heartbreaking in one sense because so many women mm. are just so desperate for their trauma to be healed. Yeah. But it was so beautiful because God is so desperate to heal their trauma as well. So He showed up and He just did incredible things. So, so good. it was just it was just amazing, and His love was just permeated all the way through it. So hmm. that was last year. So I'm yeah. there's there's lots of things that God has given me um, that uh, He's doing yeah. for this year, but. I'm just waiting on him for those doors to open. Yeah. Um, my book has been translated into Urdu, a wow. Muslim language in Pakistan. That's and awesome. 1,500 copies of my book has been handed out to the people in Pakistan, men and women wow. of my story, uh, which is just phenomenal. And I'm working at the moment with uh, Goha. Almas, who he and his wife, Komal, and he translated my book, but he also sings as well. So he's translating one of my poems into a song that will be released Aww. in mid-February, I think. He's he's written the tune and the words um, mm. of a song that I, a poem that I wrote called God is Listening. Aww. So there's amazing things that God is opening up. and that's awesome. Uh, that's, it's just an honor and a privilege to serve God in such a way. Yeah. Uh, now it's just incredible. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm just sharing out of my experience of what God's done for me and just saying, if He did it for me, He can do it for you. Amen. And, and offering that, uh, just offering mm -hmm. those um, things and tools for women to be able to have for their own lives. That's so, awesome. Yeah, so that's see awesome. what this year opens up. But, um, yeah, yeah, my heart is just to see, obviously to see and not just women but men, women, children, any age, any age because yeah. trauma is trauma and it's not right. gender-based. And That's right. And so, yeah, just to see just humanity healed with the love of Jesus yeah. uh, and restored and... Yeah. To, for them to fulfill the destiny of Amen. the victory that he has for each and every every one that, yeah. that trusts in him for it. He'll do it. He'll do it. Yeah. So God. that's my passion and that's awesome. That's that's all I want to do is just help yeah. others find well, that's their victory. A beautiful story you've shared, Megan. I know that many will be encouraged and in how your life um, has been transformed really to really touch others who've been through similar things or different things that you uh, can help them with through the journey you walked out. And that that's just so exciting that God is using you now um, to share what you have been through to help others. So it's such a beautiful ending. I mean, it's not an ending, but it's, it's actually a beginning really for you to just continue into and really pour into these lives that God brings, God, God's bringing your way. So why don't you yeah. close with um, reading that poem, and then we'll just pray for our viewers um, before we go tonight. But this poem, I, I really felt it was really significant. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The Weaver by Grant Colfax Tuller. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colours. He weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. 
not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares, nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those mm. who leave the choice to him. Wow. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So let's pray. Megan, would you pray for our viewers to, uh, today that are listening and those who will watch yeah. even at a later day? Amen. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father God. Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. You yes. are so amazing, God. Yes, Father. You are so amazing. Hallelujah. Jesus. You love each and every person, Lord, who has been watching today. Yes. Father. You know their circumstances. You know their past. You know their mm -hmm. bull threads and their dark yeah. threads and and their knotted ends. You know everything about each and every one of their lives. And yes, so, Father Jesus. God, I just pray that even right now you would fall down in such love and power and grace upon their lives, Father God, and that that you would start a healing process in them. If if they need healing for any any traumas, Lord, I pray that it would start right now. Yes. And it would it would start and you would go to the root of their issues, Father God, and you would shine mm -hmm. your light and your love and yeah. all the darkness would mm -hmm. flee yes. from their lives, Father God, that you would just bring them through individually and personally, mm -hmm. each one into total victory, that they can rise up and walk and live in the destiny that you have called each one of them to live. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you for each precious, yes, each precious person, yes. Lord, that you know everything. Yeah. about their lives and that father god that you have them in the palm of your hand yes. let them rest in the peace and trust you no matter what they are going through let them trust you father god. yes jesus yes father we thank, thank you, you for father. this in jesus name yes father we we do thank you for each and every one who tuned in today god i pray lord that you would just reach down and touch them wherever they're at father that that Megan's story will really uh, just penetrate their heart and they will know, even as Jesus said to Megan when she was 14 years old, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Father, help each and every one who is watching today to know that you will never leave them and you will never forsake them. Father, that you're there in their time of trouble. You're there to uh, break addiction. You're there to heal the soul. You're there to heal the rejection and the trauma. Father, I just thank you for everyone who's watching. I know, Lord, that you're doing something tonight. I believe that this was for such a time as this, that this testimony was shared today. So God, we, we glorify you and we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. Lord, we thank you for hope and we thank you for a future. God, and we, we do what even Megan said, you know, let the Lord, tell the Lord what you believe he said and, and just proclaim it. Lord, you said you would do this. And Lord, so we believe that you will. So tonight I pray for those who are crying out for things they've been waiting for, longing for, hoping for, that you would now do what you said you would do as we surrender our hearts and our lives to you. God, we give you the glory, and this is all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.